So for today's webinar, again entitled LGBTQ Plus Aging in Canada, What Can We Learn from the CLSA, I'd like to introduce Dr. Arne Stinchcomb and Dr. Kimberly Wilson. Uh, uh, Dr. Wilson will actually be presenting first. She's an assistant professor in adult development and aging in the Department of Family Relations and Applied Nutrition at the University of Guelph. As a social gerontologist, her program of research is broadly focused on health and well-being for aging individuals and aging populations. Her current research is focused on understanding and accounting for diverse experiences of aging with a particular focus on LGBTQ plus older adults. And then uh, after uh, Dr. Wilson will be Dr. Arne Stinchcomb, who is an assistant professor, professor in the Master of Applied Gerontology program at Brock. He maintains expertise in psychosocial aspects of health, aging, and older adulthood. He has a particular focus on inclusion and diversity with older adult populations, and his research seeks to promote health and well-being among older LGBTQ plus populations. So, I think we will get started now and uh, turn it over to Dr. Wilson. If I can. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I think you're good to go. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, I just want to start by saying thank you to the folks at CLSA for this invitation and for the opportunity to present some of our research. And I also understand that we have a great group on the line today, but I just want to thank all of you for taking some time out of your day to join us. Uh, today, Arne and I will be sharing some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years focused on LGBTQ plus aging. And that is the experiences of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people. And before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that the work we're presenting today was funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and we're grateful for their support. In the next 40 minutes or so, we plan to share with you some of the background information that led us into this work. And then I'll be turning it over to Arne, who will share with you some of the information about the CLSA, and then walk you through some of our findings related to the participants in the CLSA who are lesbian, gay, or bisexual, including highlighting some of the health disparities, their caregiver status and roles, uh, mental health, and then we'll end with some considerations of the data and opportunities for future work in this area. And uh, as Jennifer mentioned, we want to make sure that we leave lots of time for questions, so please be able to put them into the chat as we go along. So much of what we know about LGBTQ plus aging comes from research out of the United States and other international jurisdictions. Their work has shown that there are higher rates of mental illness and chronic disease among LGBTQ plus people. And we also know that LGBTQ plus people, older adults, have historical experiences of discrimination discrimination, and they carry those with those today and continue to have some in their aging experiences. These minority stress experiences adversely affect the health and well-being of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities. Theories of human development emphasize historical experiences and context. And LGBTQ plus older people have experienced social historical contexts that are unique from their heterosexual peers, but also from younger LGBTQ plus cohorts. For our purposes, it's important to note there are some shared similarities across jurisdictions, um, such as the removal of homosexuality from the DSM in 1973, but there are some important unique considerations for our context. So in 1969, Canada decriminalized uh, homosexuality. Um, in 2005, uh, the Civil Marriage Act made same-sex marriage legal, and it wasn't until 2017 that Bill C-16 added gender identity and gender expression to the Canadian Human Rights Act. So it's important to note that there are some unique pieces here in Canada that are relevant for us. We also know that these are individuals and communities who have enormous strengths and have demonstrated resiliency. One great example is the age crisis, the networks that were created, the care networks that were created, as well as the advocacy work through the LGBTQ plus community. We also know that Canada's population is aging, 
and is becoming increasingly diverse. And so it makes it very important for us to examine LGBTQ plus older adults within our context. As noted earlier, when we look at the health and well being of sexual and gender minorities, we see poor health outcomes relative to their majority peers. So, why is this the case? Well, we can look to Dr. Elon Meyer's pioneering work from UCLA, who suggests that health disparities among LGBTQ people relate to minority stressors like stigma, discrimination, real or perceived threats. And this requires increased vigilance. Uh, concealment of one's identity, and internalization of neg negative societal perceptions. <clears throat> the minority threat model informs much of our work. So in addition to the research from our colleagues in other countries, um, we've been working together as a team for several years to look at the Canadian experience. Um, our first project started uh, initially with some funding from the Law Commission of Ontario, where we asked the question, what are the unique needs needs of LGBTQ plus older adults at the end of their lives. Initial work in this area was focused on end of life and through focus groups with uh, LGBTQ plus older adults from across Ontario, we learned that they have unique health and psychosocial needs and their end of life concerns were related to inclusion, relationships, maintaining identity, and most importantly, staying out of the closet. They identified fears of formal care systems which included social isolation, decreased independence, and increased vulnerability to stigma. As a result of that, we were inspired to go to care providers to ask them about their experiences serving and caring for LGBTQ plus older adults. And what we found is that many of the care providers that are currently working in the system lack training to provide culturally sensitive care for LGBTQ plus older persons. So with these unique social historical contexts in Canada, plus what we know around experiences of biphobia and homophobia, along with our research that showed that folks have fears related to personal safety and discrimination with the care system, it felt increasingly important that we look at the health of LGBTQ plus older adults. And the CLSA, as Arne will talk you through, is a unique platform from which to examine trajectories of health in relation to age, sex and gender, sexual orientation, and psychosocial determinants. So from here, I'm going to pass it over to Arne, who will walk you through then the CLSA data and what we were able to do within this study. Great. So thanks so much, Kim and Jennifer, and hello, everyone uh, on the line. Um, so I'll be sharing some of the analyses that we've been working on over the last few years on LGB aging in Canada. But before we get there, uh, for those of you who may not know, what is exactly is the CLSA? Well, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or the CLSA, is the largest, most comprehensive research platform and infrastructure available for aging research with longitudinal data that will span 20 years from over 50,000 Canadians who at the age of, or who at baseline were 45 years of age. Older. So um, the CLSA will collect data from participants every three years for 20 years. It, it collects a wealth of data, psychosurvey social data, uh, sorry, psychosocial survey data and physical assessments. And for the first time, uh, the CLSA offers population level data on the biopsychosocial aspects of aging as a sexual minority in Canada. So there are two cohorts within the CLSA. So on the left here, we can see the tracking cohort, and on the right, we can see the comprehensive cohort. The tracking cohort is made up of, of, of about over uh, 20,000 folks who complete uh, tel telephone interviews uh, every three years. And the comprehensive cohort are just about over 30,000 uh, participants who, in addition to completing interviews, also complete uh, physical assessments where they go into a data collection site. So just to give you an idea of where the data are collected, um, the tracking cohort participants can be almost anywhere in Canada, so we haven't quite reached the territories yet. Um, and then the comprehensive cohort, uh, those are those big red dots that you see on your screen. So there are 11 data collection sites uh, across Canada. So at baseline, this is a community sample, but the intention is to follow participants as some of them transition into more formal types of care. 
as I mentioned, the CLSA collects a wealth of data. So um, physical and cognitive uh, measurements, health information, uh, psychosocial variables, which we'll be focusing on today, as well as some lifestyle and, and sociodemographic variables. So in terms of what data are available, um, right now, um, baseline and first follow-up data are available for analysis, so data from over uh, 51,000 participants who, again, at baseline were 45 to 85 years old. And I'd encourage um, individuals who are interested to check out the CLSA website for more information. In 2018, the Public Health Agency of Canada and Employment Social Development Canada commissioned a report to look at some of these baseline data within the CLSA with a focus uh, on health and aging. So there are 12 chapters as part of this report, ranging from mental health to transportation. And Kim and I contributed a chapter on LGB aging, which we'll talk a little bit about. For those of you who are educators, um, I find that in my own teaching, um, the report is an exceptional teaching resource. Um, so if this is relevant to your work, and I speculate that it might be, please do um, check it out. So what were the participants asked uh, about sex and sexual orientation uh, at baseline? So in terms of sexual orientation, participants were asked whether they are heterosexual, that is sexual relations with people of the opposite sex, homosexual, that is lesbian or gay, bisexual, that is sexual relations with people of both sexes. And in terms of sex, they were asked whether, whether they are male or female. And with this particular question, we can't ascertain whether participants are responding based on their sex assigned at birth or their gender identity. So in our own research, we refer to this variable as sex slash gender, and we refer to participants as women and men. So in terms of some of the characteristics of lesbian, gay, and bisexual participants in the CLSA, just uh, about 2%, so just over 1,000 folks self-identified as LGB within the CLSA at baseline, relative to heterosexual participants. Sexual minority participants were younger, and they reported higher levels uh, of education. We did note some differences in terms of total household income, such that gay and bisexual men had lower uh, total household income um, in comparison to um, heterosexual peers of the same sex and they were less likely to be retired as well. LGB participants in the sample were more likely to reside in urban environments and they were less likely to own their own homes. Um, they were less likely to be married and more likely to report being single, having never married or lived with a partner. Um, Importantly, LGB participants were more likely to report being lonely at least some of the time in comparison to heterosexual peers. And they were also more likely to be living alone. Um, we looked at uh, scores on a measure of social support, which is a, comp a composite measure of social support called the MOS Social Support Survey. Um, and what we found is that gay and bisexual men had the lowest levels of social support, um, whereas lesbian and bisexual women had the highest levels of uh, social support in the sample. We also noted that LGB participants were really active in their communities, um, yet they also reported the desire to participate more in their communities and social, recreational, and group activities. And through focus groups that Kim and I have conducted with LGBTQ older adults from across Canada, we've heard that loneliness is a, a major concern. Um, and this was coupled with an interest in innovative approaches to things like aging in place and housing and communal housing, which may be some of the solutions to address uh, social isolation. So again, here we see the vast majority of LGB participants, men and women, are participating um, within their communities at least once a week. Um, but that said, they do want the opportunity to participate more. And again, through some focus groups, we've heard um, that there is a desire to participate more socially in, in community through volunteer work, maybe with uh, LGBTQ youth, but that they may experience some barriers to such participation. In terms of self-perceived health, the CLSA uses three questions to assess uh, self-reported health. So participants are to asked to describe their physical health, 
their mental health uh, and their healthy aging. And here we can see that LGB participants, um, most of them are saying that their health is either very good or excellent. And this is in spite of many of them having at least one chronic disease and a higher lifetime prevalence of mental illness. So I think this highlights resilience within this particular population. The data that I've shown you so far are highly descriptive. Um, and we wanted to model some of the data which would allow us to control for relevant uh, covariates. So given that this is the first time that we have data on sexual orientation within a, a, a national population health survey that is representative, we wanted to, concern, uh, to sorry, confirm some of the international data that are showing health disparities among sexual um, minority communities that are aging in Canada. Again, much of the data that we, ha that we have is from the United States of America. So um, going forward, we pooled the tracking in comprehensive cohorts, and we looked at self-reported lifetime diagnosis of chronic disease and mental illness. So these are questions like, um, has a doctor ever told you that you have asthma, for example? We first performed crude logistic regression, and then we adjusted for some known covariates. So things like age, income, education, and province, and all of our analyses were stratified by sex and gender. So here we see some of the results for women. After adjustment, we see an increased odds of asthma, mood disorders, being a former smoker, and heavy drinking. And again, this is consistent with the minority stress framework and aligns with some of the international estimates that show higher rates of chronic disease after adjustment among sexual minority women. And when we look at the results for men, we see a very similar pattern of results. So gain by sexual men had a 1.9 uh, greater odds of reporting a mood disorder in comparison to heterosexual men after adjustment. Again, asthma came out as significant um, cancer, um, being a current smoker, and interestingly, seeing a psychologist within the last 12 months came out as significant. So this was important um, because, again, we were replicating some of the international estimates. Some of this work is published in the Canadian Journal of Public Health, and a follow-up analysis showing higher prevalence of migraine headache among gay and bisexual men was published in the Journal uh, of Headache. And I, and I just want to mention the hard work of Nicole Hammond, who is a PhD student uh, in epidemiology at the University of Ottawa, who's worked um, substantially on, on these analyses. So we know that minority stress is associated with health disparities uh, among sexual minority communities, but other research highlights minority stress as contributing to the development of coping resources throughout the lifespan. We know that for members of these communities, um, families of choice or fictive kin are really important to them. We know that social support networks are diverse uh, and linked to health among members of these communities. So um, as a next step, we wanted to look at social network size. Um, we wanted to look at the provision of inform informal care uh, and the relationship to the care recipient. I'm a pet owner, and I also wanted to know about um, pet ownership within these communities. So um, all of these analyses are adjusted for relevant covariates uh, as, appro uh, as appropriate. And the provision of care, so caregiving was captured by asking participants if they provided, to, if they provided support uh, in the last 12 months, and if they did, um, who that person was. So the results showed that lesbian and bisexual women, as well as gay and bisexual men, had fewer children in comparison um, to their heterosexual peers. And this is important because when we start to think uh, about informal caregiving, we know that children are often the built-in caregivers um, within our families, within our society. Lesbian and bisexual women had higher rates of pet ownership, and this is a finding consistent with, with some of the qualitative literature showing that companion animals are an, an important source of strength and support for LGBTQ older adults. We saw um, lots of caregiving, so 49% of lesbian and bisexual women were providing care, which is very similar to heterosexual women but we saw higher rates of caregiving among gay and bisexual men relative to heterosexual men. So 
we saw that in terms of um, the recipient of the care, that it was likely to be a friend uh, or, or an older parent. In terms of the types of care provided, LGB participants were more active in providing transportation, assistance with activities, and meal preparation. I think some of these findings help us think differently about care and care networks. We often talk about the gendered nature of care, and perhaps we should also be thinking about sexual orientation when, when we think about support services uh, for caregivers. Some of these analyses um, are published in the um, International Journal of Human Development. And I want to acknowledge the work of Miriam Ismail, who recently completed her degree, or her master's degree, rather, in counseling. So next, we wanted to look at contemporary experiences of mental illness. So just to remind you that previously, we were looking at lifetime prevalence. Now we wanted to know about uh, participants' contemporary experiences with mental illness. So we looked at um, psychological distress uh, and depression within the last four weeks. And we also looked at social support. So here we looked at the Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale, the CESD-10, and the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale, K-10. And again, we looked at the uh, MOS Social Support Survey. And again, adjusted for relevant covariates as appropriate. So we see that gay and bisexual men had an increased odds of screening positive for depression as well as psychological dis distress. And again, this is contemporary mental illness, not lifetime uh, prevalence. We also saw low levels of perceived social support, especially among gay and bisexual men, high levels of perceived social support among lesbian and, and bisexual women. Again, we saw higher levels of loneliness among gay and bisexual men. And I think some of these results really highlight opportunities for supporting uh, aging LGBT people. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Kim, who's gonna speak some more uh, about some of the implications of this work. Great, thanks, Aaron. So in terms of implications, um, I think that hopefully you've seen through some of the findings that are presented, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us. But first, we just want to talk a little bit about some of the considerations of the data that we need to uh, keep in mind when interpreting. So as I mentioned earlier on, 72% um, of the uh, participants who are lesbian, gay, and bisexual were less than age 65. So at baseline, which these analyses are presenting from, um, we're largely capturing the midlife experience of participants. So, you know, it's, we'll be interested to see how these continue to evolve and, and change as we have the opportunity to follow folks over time. Um, I see already that there's a question about this, so I want to um, address it here in terms of one of the considera considerations. Um, gender identity was not asked at baseline, so what we were presenting today was only related to um, sexual orientation and folks who are identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Um, so at this moment, although, you know, in our title, we're advertising what can we learn about LGBTQ plus uh, aging, at this moment, we are not able to um, analyze any other identities within the LGBTQ plus community beyond lesbian, gay, and bisexual. Um, also, as Arn mentioned, um, uh, in terms of the sampling uh, framework for the CLSA, at this moment, um, we have no data included in this for northern, rural, and remote older LGBT individuals who are likely underrepresented because the territories are not captured within, um, within the sample. Um, but with that in mind, um, I think that there are some really interesting um, implications for us moving forward. So um, I think we, we hope that we're building the case here that we need to consider sexual orientation as a determinant of health within an aging population. Um, and, and in some of the lists of social determinants of health, um, it doesn't always come up. And I think we're seeing here that it really does um, it potentially have an impact on folks' aging experiences. Um, I think, too, um, there's an opportunity for us to be uh, thinking about strengths-based approaches and how we are developing our future policy, practice, and clinical work 
um, that draws on the strengths of the, the LGBTQ plus individuals and communities. Um, here too, I think that this data, these data, and some of the future work that will come out of the CLSA gives us an opportunity to think about inclusive and equitable program and policy responses. And I think here, you know, one of the really great examples, as Arne mentioned, is, um, for example, when it comes to caregiving. So much of the um, literature around caregiving and gerontology talks about the gender of experience. And therefore, a lot of our support groups or programs um, or policies um, think about that gendered experience. And perhaps we need to also consider creating spaces that are open and supportive of those who are you know, lesbian, um, gay, and bisexual older adults who are in caregiving roles who may not be captured when we take that sort of majority lens in our planning. So we um, are excited about the opportunity to look at aging trajectories um, in the future and also to think about how these social historical contexts as they continue to evolve um, shape the aging experience of the current cohort of older adults and those who are coming up behind them. So we wanted to leave a lot of time um, for questions and um, engagement because we, we know this is, um, you know, as Arne mentioned, this is the first time we've had this type of data here in Canada. So we, I can see that there's some questions coming in already. So I think we'll turn it over to Jennifer then who can maybe facilitate the question and answer period. Great. Okay, so thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, I think I know I learned a lot, so I'm guessing others uh, learned a lot as well. Um, of course, it always raises questions about the data as well as the outcomes, and, and now we'll be able to have a chance to discuss those. Um, just a reminder that muting will remain on, but you can enter your questions into the into the chat box um, within the the bottom corner of the WebEx window. So hopefully you've all figured figure that out. Um, so I'll start with the first, so you did, I, I think Kim, you were monitoring the questions as you went, so that's great. Um, uh, maybe following up with the, uh, the one question where it says, where are trans folks? Um, I think there was also a question about two-spirited and how uh, and any indigenous populations that may have been captured may have not identified as gay or lesbian because they may identify as two-spirit. I'm wondering if you can just explain and talk to why that was not represented in your work. Can you hear me? Hello? Can everyone hear me? Yes, yeah. I think you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so again, the LGB participants within the CLSA made up about 2% of participants. So when we're, whenever we're doing data analysis, we kind of have to make some decisions uh, about how we're going to slice and, and dice the data. So um, we've had other comments before about separating out bisexual participants, which I think is a similarly important um, important approach, but absolutely um, the examination of ethnic diversity within the LGB sample uh, is a priority for us. It's just with these initial descriptive statistics, I, 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 it was a priority for us to, um, uh, to, to maintain as much data as we could. Uh, we, we didn't want to break down the data in, into really small cell sizes, which would impact our statistical power, but I absolutely take your point and that is on the horizon for us. Great. Um, so now I'll, I'll go to the top of the question since I already started uh, asking them out of order. Um, so the first question related to the strategies to address the isolation and loneliness that was addressed and whether you um, can talk to some strategies that you know of or have, have come across in relation to that. Yeah, and I'm happy to take a stab at this one. Can you hear me just to make sure? Okay. Yes, okay, great. So I, that's a great question and uh, thank you for raising it. Um, I think through, you know, the literature that we've been looking at and some of the other research we've been doing, um, we've been thinking quite a bit about this. So 
I think the first thing I want to say is how important it is to create safe spaces for people to be engaging with one another so that um, social isolation and loneliness may be part of the fact that folks are not sure if the different um, community groups or opportunities to engage in activities in their community are safe and inclusive spaces. And I think what we've learned and heard is that um, within LGBTQ plus communities and groups, older adults sometimes feel excluded. And then within aging, the LGBTQ plus folks also feel like they're not represented. So in some ways they fall in between sort of the two different communities where there might be, um, you know, specific programming or activities around reducing uh, loneliness or social isolation. And so having that lens to think about, do we need, you know, particular targeted um, events for the LGBTQ plus Q plus folks in our community or thinking about ways to ensure that we're showing that the activities and events we have in our communities are inclusive and open to all are really important. And there's been some really great work happening in Canada around reducing social isolation. So I think coming out of the 2015 Canadian New Horizons project, you know, for example, there's work out of Hamilton around the seniors isolation impact plan and work out of BC um, where they were bringing together resources around social isolation as well. So there's some really great work out there around reducing social isolation. And then I think it's important that we put on that sort of LGBTQ plus lens to ensure that it's working for all older adults. Um, and if you're interested in thinking about how to do that, uh, ESDC also put out a toolkit recently um, specifically looking at social isolation and LGBTQ plus communities. And within their toolkit, they have um, sort of suggestions for how to create inclusive ideas exchange events for LGBTQ plus seniors. Um, and I think within that sort of safety around uh, spaces um, is really important. And when I think about some of the work out of the states, there's, there's been um, a strong focus on intergenerational work. So congregate uh, meals, for example, between LGBTQ plus youth and LGBTQ plus older adults. Um, but I think where possible, the strategies should come from the community as well. So working with existing um, you know, agent pride groups to think about asking them what they perceive will work best and then working with them to reach out to those who may be um, particularly socially isolated or lonely. Great, thanks for that response. Hopefully that uh, gave, I think it was Shanika Chine or Shanika, some, some good input. Um, the next question was, we've already answered part of it, uh, the first part of it was what are the relevant covariants for these findings and then of course you've already responded to the um, to the second part of that question so what which are the relevant co covariants for these findings yeah so in in the report we we did find differences in age obviously in household income in education um, and we suspect that there are some regional differences as well so in, in our analyses we controlled for age income education and, and province And uh, again, thanks to Janine who raised the um, question related to um, to spirited, and I think uh, that's been re that's been addressed. Um, going down, and then of course Alexander also commented, "Thank you. I agree on the importance of breaking the data ba down based on uh, race and ethnicity. Um, this is something actually from a CLSA perspective we are aware of and hoping to provide researchers with some." in doing that down the road um, and then so next we have the question what is the minority stress model that was mentioned can we get an explanation of it so maybe I don't know if you can put that slide back up and maybe give a bit more explanation on that all right I'm just pulling the slide up if you want to speak to it if that's helpful sure so this is some work um, that's come out of UCLA uh, by dr. Elan Meyer so we, we do see these health disparities across the lifespan um, among LGBT people, and or LGBTQ people rather, and we we attribute these um, these disparities to stress experiences associated with their marginalized identity. So things like stigma and discrimination, and real or perceived threats that they endure. And when we think about it within the aging context, we can think about the accumulation of all of these 
negative uh, experiences related to their marginalized identity, which might result in increased vigilance. Um, it could, uh, individuals could conceal their identities, so hide um, their LGBTQ identity, and maybe even internalize these negative societal perceptions. So this relates to things like coping behaviors, um, relationships with others, uh, and ultimately has been linked to these um, in increased risk of chronic disease. Right, moving along, hopefully that gives you a bit more context for the minority stress uh, model. Um, the next question is um, to try to address loneliness and as specifically as service providers, did the research indicate how best to engage LGBTQ plus population? And if not, perhaps address through the research if you can maybe speak to um, any best practices or um, evidence mm -hmm. that you're reviewing. Um, I think if I'm sort of, I'm also just sort of scrolling through the chat here, I think that this question came from Jane, who I think sort of felt that maybe that was um, answered in the previous response, but um, asking for more information around the toolkit. So I can indeed put a link into the toolkit, um, but I'll just say it again, it comes from Employment and Social Development Canada, and the title is Social Isolation of Seniors a focus on LGBTQ plus seniors in Canada. And again, um, you know, through there they, they have, within part two, they have a toolkit and examples of inclusive ideas exchange events for LGBTQ plus seniors. Great, and maybe, I don't know if uh, one of our team members can find that in the background and potentially post a link to it. Um, and if not, hopefully you got the the information um, to find it. Okay, so next question. Uh, from previous research and perhaps not the CLSA, what are the differences or similarities for either barriers or facilitators to research participation in the older adult LGBTQ plus community? And knowing this, do you have any advice on how researchers um, can address this and be more inclusive? Um, Arne, I'll take the first stab at this and then feel free to jump in. Is that okay? Yep. So, um, hi, Laura. Thanks for your question. Um, so, I think that, um, you know, in our work with uh, the, the sort of the program of research developing this area, we've learned a lot about this. And um, we have been educated a lot by the folks who have participated in our uh, focus groups, for example. And I think we need to think about that social historical context. So, there there are many folks in the older population who have been engaged in, in research throughout their lifetimes, and the research was not always done uh, perhaps the most ethical way um, or with always sort of the best intentions, uh, particularly folks in the LGBTQ plus community. So there's a, a documentary called The Fruit Machine, um, which sort of outlines how historically researchers have not done um, a very good job working with LGBTQ plus older adults who are, who are now older and we're asking to participate in research. So I think it's really important that we think about, again, um, building credibility and building trusting relationships with uh, communities who we may ask to support our research. So um, we have found that partnering with uh, community organizations and spending time to build that trust and relationship is really important. Um, and as part of that, ensuring that we are reporting back to the communities that we're partnering with so that they know how we are using, um, you know, their stories and experiences, again, with our goal of promoting more equitable aging experiences, but making sure that that, you know, we really walk the talk that we are telling them we're going to do. And, you know, similar, I think, to some uh, research philosophies of working with folks who have been marginalized in the past, you know, we've adopted sort of um, a co-researcher approach, so trying to sort of embody that nothing about us without us. So particularly for qualitative research where we're asking people to come in and share their stories um, and aging experiences with us, um, we are partnering with older adults from LGBTQ plus communities who are helping us to design the research and make sure that it is, you know, conducted in a way that is inclusive and safe and respectful. Um, and so we are sort of partnering that approach with then the opportunities we have for these large uh, data sets available to us through the CLSA. 
and just Laura, the name of the documentary is called The Fruit Machine. And it, again, it is available on TVO. So if you're in Canada, um, you would have access to watch it um, on their website um, at no cost. I hope that answers that question. Um, did uh, Arne want to add to it? That was a that was a great response, Kim. And I'll just add that some, with respect to the CLSA, some of fighting against this uh, you know negative experiences that members of these communities have had with researchers has been, uh, in my in my case, bringing some of the findings from the CLSA and presenting to local groups who are really excited to hear about the work, uh, and also have some really great critiques and commentary about how to do the work going forward. So that's been really really fun. Thanks for those responses. Um, the next question is actually a question I also had, so thank you, Dean, for articulating it. Is there a breakdown of, feeling of feelings of isolation and loneliness across the age cohorts? Um, ageism is more prevalent earlier um, in the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community and especially amongst gay men. That's a really good question. Uh, and, and in some ways, it kind of relates to this idea of how do we uh, ahead of time decide about how we want to slice it and, and dice the data. Um, it, it, it would be great if we had a really large sample of LGB participants. We, are, we only have a thousand folks, which for some analyses is great, but in terms of looking at cohort, different, cohort differences, we are somewhat limited. So uh, I would suggest that we would have to include both men and women um, um, LGB participants in that analysis, uh, and, and probably look at some large cohort, uh, cohort, age cohort groups. Um, but certainly, we could do that. We haven't yet uh, yet done it, and I and I agree. I suspect that there are likely some some cohort differences there. I also just wanted to note that uh, Sarah Youssef, who works at our Statistical Analysis Center in Montreal, um, which is part of the CLSA, posted that the follow-up one wave of CLSA data does include a questionnaire on gender identity. The response options do include identification of trans and the possibility of specifying other gender identities in open text. So as we move forward in the CLSA, that was something that was identified and um, in the follow-up one data collection and all subsequent, that question is going to be asked. Um, and I believe the toolkit uh, will be shared, or at least the information was identified. And so we'll go on to a question from Wook Yang. How did you go about dealing with the huge difference in number of respondents in each group, uh, heterosexual versus sexual minority population, during your analyses? Uh, not for a descriptive, but for the regressions, but for regressions, for example. So if you could speak to that. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and um, quite honestly, um, that work was <laughs> performed um, two years ago now, so it, it's not as fresh as it, it, it probably should be. Um, I could go back to to our paper um, and get back to you on that one, absolutely. All right, fair enough. Um, so we'll go to Baram. Uh, who asks, has there been any efforts to link the CLSA data for LGB, um, for the LGB population with different healthcare registries to better understand their healthcare utilization patterns and or outcome? So maybe I'll let uh, one of the presenters answer that and, if, and uh, then I'll, I'll give my response on behalf of CLSA. <laughs> so um, that's a great question uh, and I would love to do that. So we have in our data request, we have requested some of the linked data. Um, we are still uh, getting our first follow-up um, data screened and cleaned, um, but that is some of our intention to use some of that, that linked data and I'm, and I'm looking forward to hearing what the CLSA response is about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so just the, the quick answer is that the CLSA is, has, has had a, a, a focus on creating linked data for the past, well, several years. Um, it's, it's not an easy process and we've been working with various um, uh, provincial and national uh, registries and to um, obtain vital status data that we can use for our, um, uh, to enhance our database. Um, we've linked with, um, we've linked environmental data into the CLSA, but we're also in the process of 
outside of some small pilot studies where we've been um, trying to work out the processes, still trying to really um, uh, link provincial health registries with CLSA data. So it's a work in progress and we do anticipate it's going to happen, uh, but for now um, linking it with, um, it, it's actually all that data is not um, uh, available right now. So that's the kind of short but long answer. Um, so maybe I'll go on to uh, next question. There's a few more here and we do have uh, about 10 minutes left. So how are the specific histories of those socio-historical issues mentioned incorporated into the research. For example, the specific colonial history of anti-sodomy um, laws and their repeal. Um, so I'm happy to take a first answer at this and then of course Arne jump in. So um, thank you for that question. We always make a uh, um, and a, you know, an effort to always bring in that social historical context in any of the work that we're doing. Um, and in particular, we've heard from some of the older adults that we've worked with how important this is because some feel that that sort of social historical context is getting lost with the next, you know, the younger generations weren't aware of sort of their unique histories. And so um, we mentioned, and it's up on the slide here, that a lot of our work is informed by the minority stress model. We also look to the health equity promotion model that Karen Fredrickson Goldson, who's sort of the lead researcher in this area out of the United States, we've referenced her several times throughout this, um, has developed this model that embeds both the minority stress uh, model, but also a life course approach that in particular looks at those social historical contexts. So we particularly in our analyses and discussion and thinking about um, you know, future work, we always go back to sort of that unique social historical context. Um, and this is, I think, a place where some of our other research where we are working directly with older adults and hearing their life histories and stories and experiences, you know, we try to bring back their narratives into all of our interpretation of what we're doing um, to really contextualize it in those individual lived experiences. Um, which is why it's been nice to have the, the opportunity to look at the CLSA data and then you know, marry, marry that with some of the qualitative work that we've been doing um, where folks are talking about how those early experiences continue to shape their aging experiences. I'll just add that it, it would be great if uh, the CLSA included a measure of historical experiences uh, with discrimination. Uh, at this time it doesn't, but perhaps in future ways uh, that could be included. Well, you never know. Um, thanks for those responses. Uh, so we do have a, just wanted to mention, we do have a few more minutes. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to post them um, and we'll go to as close to one o'clock as possible. Uh, but for now, we will answer another question by Janika. Um, you mentioned the health disparities, uh, which you were also just talking about. Uh, can you comment on the barriers to accessing healthcare or achieving health equity for this population? Waiting to see who's going to take that first. Do you want me to go first, turn or do you want to answer? I can go. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, that could be a presentation in and, in and of itself. Uh, I, I think some of the things that we're hearing uh, are around affirming care for LGBTQ older adults. We, we know that there's a lot of fear uh, and individuals within these communities may not seek out medical treatment for fear of discrimination within the healthcare system. So affirming healthcare, I, I think, is a, a, a major um, step towards um, reducing some of these disparities. Um, Kim? <laughs> Yeah, and I I think to you know the affirming care, and then also in particular, um, you know, I think there's two ways for us to think about this. We need to start now with the current cohort of older adults, but we also need to think about sort of that lifelong approach. And when we use um, sexual orientation and gender identity as social determinants of health, and if we start thinking about that, that from the beginning, hopefully it will sort of make some differences in terms of that health equity lens that we'll be putting, you know, on every time we're looking at access to services. Um, so, I think, you know, there's a lot of work to do with our current cohort of midlife and older adults, but also to think about that lifelong approach. And if we embed more explicitly 
sexual orientation and gender identity as social determinants, I think that will help us in terms of uh, health equity for future generations as well. Maybe I'll just add that I think part of, um, of addressing health equity involves these data collection initiatives, right? And we're just starting to collect data on sexual orientation among older adults. And now with the first follow-up um, wave of CLSA, now we're now we have gender identity. So. Um, uh, so, so I think this is a great start, and now it's about sort of addressing addressing some of those differences that we do see. Yeah, just a quick follow-up to that. I'm wondering if, are there other um, uh, longitudinal studies that you're aware of uh, internationally that have collected this data, or um, I thought you mentioned that this is the first of its kind in Canada, but I'm wondering if there, there are others um, internationally that you could have uh, pulled from. Certainly, there are a lot of um, data sets in the United States that do collect these data, um, and um, uh, a very large study, and I'll just do a quick quick shout out, is uh, to Karen Fredrickson Goldson, um, who has done a very large longitudinal study called the Aging with Pride Survey. So that's specific to LGBTQ uh, aging, um, and, and she's done a lot of, uh, of, of really great work. And what's interesting to see from a population health perspective is that what we're seeing in, in the United States um, is very similar to what we see in Canada. And I think um, as Canadians, we, we tend to think of ourselves as uh, quite distinct um, from our neighbors um, to the south. So we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so another question that I think relates to the finding about um, uh, accessing psychologists um, it's the question is based on the fact that psychologists are frequently consulted. Um, I believe it was uh, specifically amongst gay men um, was one of your findings. Should we promote LGBTQ plus psychology in our training programs? Um, and should we find the way to facilitate, should we find ways to facilitate access to psychological services? Mm -hmm. So do you have any comments on that? This question may have just come to me privately. I'm not sure if it's visual to everyone. I mean, I'll just say, and then I, or, and I look forward to your response, that I think we should be, um, you know, doing a better job with all of our uh, training programs to be embedding in, you know, uh, culturally competent and culturally, uh, cultural humility into our training, um, you know, for health and social professionals and psychology, social work, psychiatry, um, ensuring that we really are sort of training folks to be able to be inclusive and culturally competent. Um, and I think that piece around um, access is really important. So I, you know, we know with our current context and how folks are able to access psychological supports um, if they are, you know, community dwelling and if it's a uh, psychologist in the community, it's not necessarily covered through their um, provincial health insurance plan. So I think, you know, that is some evidence that perhaps is a nice advocacy tool part of, you know, I know the Canadian Psychologic Psychological Association has been advocating for a long time that their work should be included within insured um, health plans. And so again, I think that's another sort of supportive piece of evidence around the success of their work um, with, uh, uh, particularly with gay men and gay older adults. But I'm gonna let you chime in here. Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, part of, part of what I said earlier in terms of addressing uh, health equity was to provide uh, affirming care. And what we're seeing is that health healthcare providers uh, aren't getting um, this training within within their their regular training. And, and uh, I just want to shout out to, to Kim, who is uh, leading a short partnership development as uh, PI, looking at how do we embed uh, issues of LGBTQ aging into curricula within Ontario so that the next generation of professionals is equipped to work with members, members of these communities, uh, provide affirming care, uh, and reduce some of these health inequalities. I'd really like to thank um, Arne and Kim for a, a great webinar with lots of information about your um, new evidence um, from the CLSA that you've managed to ascertain from the CLSA data. I think definitely it will have a, uh, definitely going to be useful and will lead to some, some hopefully some change in the long term, especially as you um, are able to start complementing it with other qualitative research and again bringing the, the quantitative and qualitative research together to 
perhaps even develop some strategies um, that are informed by this work. That would be fantastic. Um, so we really appreciate your participation in this. Um, I'd also just like to, so now I'm just going to do a few reminders and plugs uh, before people do start to uh, uh, pop off. Um, the, just a reminder, the survey poll was prompted up at, on the top of your screen. Um, if you have any questions or comments that we can help with, please also feel free to write us in the chat box and we can help at that, at that point too. Um, the next uh, CLSA uh, data access request for any researchers that are interested in uh, pursuing your own research related to this topic or other topics is February 12th. Um, you can visit the CLSA website under data access to review the available data um, as well as further information and details about the application process. Um, and remember, CLSA promotes the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, um, at CLSA underscore ELCV. Um, the next webinar uh, will be um, focused on mobility and uh, uh, fall risk assessment. That will be on November 28th. And then the final webinar of 2019 will be, um, will include a focus on stroke and osteoarthritis. Um, and that'll be on December 16th. Uh, the final thing I just want to mention before we sign off is that uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fe fellows with an interest in longitudinal studies on aging are encouraged to save the date for um, what's called SPA uh, 2020. This innovative, innovative five-day training program will take place next June at Hockley Valley Resort in southwestern Ontario. Uh, more details will be available in January 2020. Um, when the program launches on CIHR's research net. So this will be require an application for uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, um, but it will be proved to be a very exciting and uh, thoughtful learning event. Uh, I think that's it. So please go to CLSA website to register for a future webinar series and join us for these webinars. And thank you again to our presenters as well as all of you for joining us today.